കാരണം അത് ഞങ്ങൾ കേൾക്കുമ്പോൾ ഞങ്ങൾ ധ്യാനിക്കുമ്പോൾ അത് ഞങ്ങളുടെ ഹൃദയത്തിൽ അത് ആദായമാകുവാൻ ഞങ്ങളുടെ വിശ്വാസ ജീവിതത്തിൽ അതൊരു ധന്യതായി തീരുവാൻ ഇടയാക്കണമെന്ന് പ്രാർത്ഥിക്കുന്നു കൂട്ടിക്കൊണ്ടുവന്ന എല്ലാ മക്കളെ ഓർത്ത് പ്രാർത്ഥിക്കുന്നു എല്ലാവരുടെ ആവശ്യങ്ങൾ ഒക്കെ അറിഞ്ഞ് അവർ ഞങ്ങളോട് പെരുമാറി ഇടപെടുകയും ചെയ്യണമെന്ന് പ്രാർത്ഥിക്കുന്നു ദൈവത്തിൻ്റെ വിശുദ്ധാത്മാവിൻ്റെ ധാരാളമായ സാന്നിധ്യം കൃപയും ഞങ്ങളുടെ മീറ്റിംഗ് ഉണ്ടാകുവാൻ ഇടയാക്കണമെന്ന് പ്രാർത്ഥിക്കുന്നു വഴിയാത്രയിലായിരിക്കുന്നവരെ സഹായിക്കണം ഞങ്ങളെ ഒന്നിച്ച് അനുഗ്രഹിക്കണം യേശു ക്രിസ്തുവിൻ്റെ നാമത്തിൽ ഞങ്ങൾ പ്രാർത്ഥന കേൾക്കണമേ മീൻ Let's all stand. It's a beautiful day that the Lord has given us to praise and worship and enter his courts with praise and thanksgiving. Amen. It's always good to give God the glory. And let's all be happy and rejoicing and you know, it's it's an amazing opportunity. It's a privilege and it says better is one day in his courts and thousands elsewhere. We'd rather be here at his word listening to his word at his feet. then being elsewhere hallelujah seek ye first the kingdom of god and his righteousness and all these things shall be added unto you will follow you hallelujah thank you lord for giving us this time to come into your presence lord help us to forget about everything else and focus and concentrate on you lord jesus help us to turn our eyes to you and help us to give our everything this evening lord jesus hallelujah we praise your name lord i will sing of the mercies of the lord forever with my mouth will i bring forth his praises hallelujah amen thank you jesus i cast my mind to calvary where jesus bled and died for me i see his wounds his hands his feet my savior on that cursed tree his body bound and drenched in tears they laid him down in joseph's tomb the entrance sealed by heavy stone Messiah still and all alone Oh praise the name of the Lord our God Oh praise his name forevermore for endless days we will sing
to see our hearts this evening Lord Jesus we come as we are hallelujah with our faults with our weaknesses but we know that Lord you see beyond all of that so great is his love so great is your love in our lives Lord Jesus hallelujah thank you Jesus hallelujah we come Lord Jesus in your presence humble ourselves Lord have your way in our lives Lord Jesus hallelujah We know that you are with us. Hallelujah. Oh, how I need your grace more than my words can say. Jesus, I come. Jesus, I come. In all my Let's sing, oh, how I need your grace. Oh, how I need your grace. More than my words can say. Jesus, I come. Jesus, I come. In all my weaknesses, you are my confidence. Jesus, I come. Jesus, 
same together it's a very old hymn very dear to my heart and this is a song that you all know hallelujah the word says it's the biggest greatest commandment love the lord with all your heart with all your mind with all your soul with everything that you have and with that love comes praises when you praise when you glorify you rejoice you find healing you find deliverance you find joy that's the assurance that's the praise that's the that's that's the god that we serve and we call upon this our evening lord hallelujah let's sing the song together blessed assurance jesus is mine who oh, what a Heir of salvation, purchase of God, born of His Spirit, washed in His blood. This is my story. This is my story. This is my submission perfect submission perfect delight visions of rapture now burst at my side angels Thank you. 
whispers of love. This is my story. that never fails, never forsakes. You're a God of promises, Lord Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you, for, thank you, Lord, for your word, your promises, that you'll never leave us nor forsake us. That you'll hold on to us, Lord Jesus. For you are our God. Hallelujah. Kashtangalilum padaridale kandu nirilum talar nirale nyanennum ninde devam niyennum ende naane nyanennum ninde devam niyennum ende kashtangalilum kashtangalilum padaridalle kannu neeridum talar neeralle nyan ennum ninde devam nee ennum ende naane nyan ennum ninde devam nee ennum ende naane ninne thagakkuvano ninne moorikkuvano கஷ்டங்களிலும் பதறிடல்லே கண்ணு நீரிலும் தளர்ந்திடல்லே ஞானென்னும் நின்றே தெய்வம் நீ என்னும் எந்தே தானே ஞானென்னும் நின்றே தெய்வம் கஷ்டங்களிலும் பதறிடல்லே 
Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Hallelujah. ഞങ്ങളുടെ ദൈവമേ സ്വർഗസവിതാവെ അവിടുത്തെ പുത്രന്റെ നാമത്തിൽ ഞങ്ങൾ വീണ്ടും ഒരുമിച്ച് കടുത്തു വരുന്നു നീ ഞങ്ങളുടെ സങ്കേതവും ബലവും കഷ്ടങ്ങളിൽ ഏറ്റവും അടുത്ത തുണയായിരിക്കിയാൽ ഞങ്ങൾ നന്ദിയോടങ്ങി സ്തുതിക്കുന്നു മകതപ്പെടുത്തുന്നു ഇന്ന് രാത്രി നിന്റെ സാന്നിധ്യം അടി ഞങ്ങളുടെ നടുവിലുണ്ടല്ലോ കർത്താവ് ഞങ്ങളുടെ ജീവിതത്തെ തിരുക്കരങ്ങളിലേക്ക് ഞങ്ങൾ സമർപ്പിക്കുന്നു നീ ആദ്യനും അന്ത്യനുമാണ് നീ അടുത്തൂടാർത്ത വെളിച്ചത്തിൽ വസിക്കുന്ന ദൈവമാണ് കർത്താവ് നിനക്ക് അസാധ്യമായിട്ടൊന്നുമില്ല നിനക്കെല്ലാം സാധ്യമാണ് 
ഇന്ന് രാത്രിയിൽ ഞങ്ങൾ അങ്ങയെ സ്തുതിക്കുന്നു മകതപ്പെടുത്തുന്നു കടന്നു വന്ന ജനത്തിനായി സ്തോത്രം വ്യക്തികളായി കുടുംബങ്ങളായി എല്ലാവരെയും അനുഗ്രഹിക്കണമേ ഇന്ന് രാത്രി ഞങ്ങൾ ദൈവോചനം കേൾക്കുവാനായിട്ട് ഞങ്ങൾ കടന്നു വന്നിരിക്കുന്നല്ലോ നാഥ അവിടുത്തെ ദാസന് ഇന്ന് രാത്രിയിൽ അഭിഷേകത്താൽ നിറയ്ക്കണമേ എന്ന് പ്രാർത്ഥിക്കുന്നു ഞങ്ങൾ കേൾക്കുന്നതായ വചനങ്ങൾ ഞങ്ങളുടെ ജീവിതത്തിൽ അത് അനുഗ്രഹമായി വിടുതലായി രൂപാന്തരമായി വെളിപ്പെടണമേ എന്ന് അങ്ങോട്ട് പ്രാർത്ഥിക്കുന്നു നസ്രേനായ യേശു ക്രിസ്തുവിന്റെ അധികാരമുള്ള നാമത്തിൽ എല്ലാ അന്ധകാരത്തെയും ഞങ്ങൾ ദൂരീകരിക്കുകയാണ് യേശുവിന്റെ സാന്നിധ്യം ഇവിടെ യാവരിക്കട്ട് കർത്താവ് നന്ദിയോട് സ്വോത്ര ഇന്ന് രാത്രി വിടുതലയിക്കണമേ എന്ന് അങ്ങോട്ട് പ്രാർത്ഥിക്കുന്നു ആവശ്യങ്ങളോത്തായിരിക്കുന്നവരെ സഹായിക്കണമേ എന്ന് പ്രാർത്ഥിക്കുന്നു പാവികൾക്ക് മാനസാന്തരം കൊടുക്കണമേ എന്ന് പ്രാർത്ഥിക്കുന്നു കർത്താവ് ഈ ദേശത്തിന് വേണ്ടി ഞങ്ങൾ പ്രാർത്ഥിക്കുന്നു ഈ ദേശത്ത് കർത്താവ് വിടുതലായി ചാട്ട് കർത്താവ് ഈ പട്ടണത്തിലുള്ള എല്ലാ ദൈവസഭകൾക്കായി ഞങ്ങൾ പ്രാർത്ഥിക്കുന്നു എല്ലാ ദൈവദാസന്മാർക്കായി ഞങ്ങൾ പ്രാർത്ഥിക്കുന്നു പ്രത്യാൽ കർത്താവ് ഈ ദൈവസഭയ്ക്ക് വേണ്ടി ഞങ്ങൾ പ്രാർത്ഥിക്കുന്നു ഇവിടെ ശുശ്രൂഷിക്കുന്ന കർത്താവിന്റെ ദാസനായി കുടുംബത്തിനായി പ്രാർത്ഥിക്കുന്നു ഇവിടെ കടന്നു വരുന്ന എല്ലാ ദൈവജനത്തിനായി പ്രാർത്ഥിക്കുന്നു കർത്താവ് അനേക ആത്മാക്കളെയും കൊണ്ട് ഈ ദൈവസഭ നിറയപ്പെടുവാൻ കർത്താവ് വരും ദിവസങ്ങൾ നമ്മുടെ നിടയാക്കുമാറാകണമെന്ന് പ്രാർത്ഥിക്കുകയാണ് ഇന്ന് ിങ്ങളെ തിരുസന്നിലേക്ക് ഏൽപ്പിക്കട്ടെ നിന്റെ ആത്മാവ് വ്യക്തമായി ഞങ്ങളോട് സംസാരിക്കണമെന്ന് പ്രാർത്ഥിക്കുന്നു ഞങ്ങളെ കർത്താവ് തിരുസന്നിലേക്ക് സമർപ്പിക്കുകയാണ് ഹല്ലേലുയ്യ നിന്റെ സാന്നിധ്യത്താൽ തുടർന്ന് ഞങ്ങളെ നിറയ്ക്കണമെന്ന് അങ്ങോട്ട് പ്രാർത്ഥിക്കുന്നു തിരുക്കരങ്ങളിലേക്ക് ഞങ്ങളെ താഴ്ത്തുന്നു പ്രാർത്ഥന കേട്ടോ നന്ദിയോട് സ്വത്രം യേശു ക്രിസ്തുവിന്റെ വിലയേറിയ നാമത്തിൽ തന്നെ അമേൻ going to take the offering at this moment the song will be sung this is the time to give to the lord deviga bhavana madhu pudu vidugal urukiyavan deviga bhavana madhu pudu vidugal urukiyavan varum നമ്മെ ചേർത്തിടുവാൻ നടുവാനതിൽ തൂ തരുമായി വരും മേഘമതിൽ നമ്മെ ചേർത്തിടുവാൻ നടുവാനതിൽ തൂ തരുമായി പ്രതിഫലം തന്നിടുവാൻ യേശുരാജൻ വന്നിടുവാൻ അധികമില്ലിനിയം ൾ നമ്മുടെ ആദികൾ തീർന്നിടുവാ അധികമില്ലിനിയും നാളുകൾ നമ്മുടെ ആദികൾ തീർന്നിടുവാ തൻ തിരുനാമത്തിനാ മണ്ണിൽ നിന്നക സഹിച്ചവരെ തൻ തിരുനാമത്തിനാ തിരുസന്നിധോ ചേർത്തു തൻ കൈകളാൽ അവരുടെ കണ്ണുതി തുടച്ചിടുവാൻ തിരുസന്നിധോ ചേർത്തു തൻ കൈകളാൽ അവരുടെ കണ്ണുതി പ്രതിഫലം തന്നിടുവാൻ യേശുരാജൻ വന്നിടുവാൻ അധികമില്ലിനിയും നാളുകൾ നമ്മുടെ ആദികൾ തീർന്നിടുവാൻ അധികമില്ലിനിയും നാളുകൾ നമ്മുടെ ആദികൾ തീർന്നിടുവാൻ അധികമില്ലിനിയും നാളുകൾ നമ്മുടെ ആദികൾ തീർന്നിടുവാൻ സ്വർഗപിതാവെ നല്ല സമയത്ത് ഒരുമിച്ച് ഞങ്ങൾ പ്രാർത്ഥിക്കുന്നു പ്രാർത്ഥിക്കുകയും ആഗ്രഹിക്കുകയും ചെയ്തപോലെ ഈ മഹായോഗത്തിൽ ഒരുമിച്ച് കടന്നു വരുന്ന സ്വർഗ്ഗം ഞങ്ങളെ ബലപ്പെടുത്തി പ്രത്യേക ആൾ ഇവിടെ അർപ്പിക്കപ്പെട്ട ആ സ്തോത്ര വഴിപാട് ഞങ്ങളുടെ കരങ്ങൾക്ക് ലഭിച്ച് പ്രാർത്ഥിക്കുന്നു അങ്ങയുടെ മക്കൾ അധ്വാനത്തിൽ നിന്ന് ദൈവനാമത്തിൽ ചെയ്ത നന്മകളെ സ്വർഗം അമർത്തിക്കുലുക്കി മുപ്പതും അറുപതും നൂറും മേനിയെ പ്രതിഫലം കൊടുക്കട്ടെ 
ദൈവരാജ്യത്തിന് കെട്ടുപണിക്കായി അത് മാറട്ടെ എന്ന് പ്രാർത്ഥിക്കുന്നു ഞങ്ങളുടെ പ്രാർത്ഥനകളും യാചനം കേട്ട് കൈ സ്തോത്രം യേശുവിൻ നാമിൽ തന്നെ on the second day of our meeting yesterday the presence of the lord was really very strong and the teachings about the deeper calling to discipleship was inspiring amen thank god for the resource person dr matthew p john uh, just uh, to introduce uh, some of the books which are right now available there are two books here the wise men and the unknown god Uh, it is a book written by dr matthew pijon and also rediscovering religion it's a mosaic series and these two books are available here and if you buy it from amazon it is 30 plus tax but here few copies are available it will be given for 20 dollars amen so you can go through that if you're lucky enough you can uh, take one copy god bless you and as we wait upon the lord shall we welcome the servant of god for this evening dr matthew pijon by giving a good clap amen welcome back um i believe most of you are here and uh, i'm seeing some new faces too um i'm going to pick up from where i left off yesterday and that is going to disappoint some of the newcomers uh but the good thing is that uh brother ranjit is doing an amazing job uh with the video the live telecasting but obviously the video will be available somewhere in the cyber world i don't know but <laughs> uh, but so if you i mean if you get confused today you might very well because i'm going to handle a very tricky passage uh if you get confused it is today so uh but before you listen to what we talked yesterday and and what we are going to speak tomorrow i don't want you to tell me any comments because it's a series uh and unfortunately you're joining in 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 between and i don't have time to do the recap uh, but i'll give you just basic setup okay obviously as you have seen in the uh, posters we are doing we are listening to the story of a passionate pursuit right and this pursuit is initiated by god himself now some of you from my little bio you probably have figured it out my area of expertise or my area of interest is world religions uh and i can speak about six major world religions pretty much uh, in any platform and one of the distinguishable difference between christianity and any other religions is that the god of the bible reveals to us a god who pursues humanity the religion is a story of man search for god religion teaches us how to go to god how to please him how to buy makeup and cosmetics so that you look pretty when you go in front of god but christianity on the other hand is a god who empties himself who leaves his glory and comes down in our form in our shape because he loves us so much that he gives himself for us so that kind of pursuit of god is nowhere you can see nowhere in in religions of the world so when i said passionate pursuit yesterday we were looking at jesus's pursuit of peter okay so we are all, we are going into another episode today between jesus and peter and tomorrow also we are going to another episode between jesus and peter these are the two main characters we are looking at so uh one of the thing we have to remember that when jesus pursues us 
when god comes after us he expects the same kind of passion from us too okay that is the best thing we can learn from uh, peter we are going to learn that today okay today we are go going to look more of how peter is returning this passion how jesus is pursuing uh, sorry how peter is pursuing jesus but before coming to that it is very important that that god's calling is for us from being a follower to a believer but then finally to a disciple so that's why a deeper calling discipleship the calling to discipleship is a deeper calling but that is essentially where we have to be it's funny yesterday we were looking at uh, uh, luke chapter 5 and i'm not going to preach the same thing again but uh, what there is one character apart from peter and and jesus uh, which has actually an uh, a very important role in that story you know what we read yesterday was where jesus comes to the you know uh, the the boat that belongs to simon and he climbs to the in the boat and you know the, that whole story how jesus calls peter right now uh, one of the characters which i really liked in that portion as i was rereading it is peter and peter's boat the boat peter's boat is an interesting character too right uh, sometimes inanimate objects can teach us wonderful lessons so uh, in so many ways that deeper calling that was deployed by jesus was applicable for that to that boat too and if you go back and read it's very interesting when you see when jesus came to the sea shore the beach there were two boats you remember there were two boats and jesus picked the one that belonged to simon that's why we talked about the intentionality jesus was looking for that particular boat so there were these two boats which were anchored on the shore right and then jesus said you know 51 i think verse 3 we don't we are not going to go back but we didn't say, uh, talk about this boat yesterday and jesus said i mean then jesus said to peter um can you put it out a little away from the land put out this boat a little away from the land so that jesus can step into the boat and he can address the audience with the distance right like good visibility right it's interesting if i am that boat it is actually a call from a stability to instability right it is much easier to be on the shore you know when jesus sees that the boat was anchored on the shore boat has nothing to fear it is on stable ground or in our language we call it it is very well settled right that is our pursuit don't do you think so right like particularly the immigrant community in the in north america we want to get settled right we want to get the job uh, we want to find that wife or husband and we want to have that right number of children and right number of cars and everything and finally we can say we get settled we want to be anchored onto the shore so that we don't have to fear anything right and then there are these two boats and the one boat jesus pursued the boat which belonged to simon like i said yesterday when god pursues you your life becomes miserable right he is going to really make you and really mold you and that's going to be a painful process so the first call which was issued by jesus to peter obviously to the board and board and peter are inseparable at that time right so there are two boards and this one board travels from stability to instability but it is still you know a little away from the land right like the little away from the land okay that's not bad you know that's where we are all comfortable you know we just want to be doing something for the lord it's not like we want to be anchored on the shore and you know uh, we only think about the material things no we want to do something meaningful for the lord we want to go to church we want to do the right thing so we want to we like i said we are not just followers we are believers we are believers we want to be believers but then verse 4 jesus issued another call right he said put out the boat 
deep into the water. Now Jesus issued that call to go deeper into the water. A call to the deep waters. Now that is the call to discipleship. Now this ship, now this little boat, which was little away from the land, which was comfortable, but now going all the way deep into the water. If a boat wants to go deep into the water, it has to burn all the bridges. Right? I would rather be in the boat which is kind of little away from the land. Just in case something happens. Right? Just in case Jesus makes some mistake. I can just step, step out into the water and run, run back to the shore. That's my comfortable position. But when you are deep into the water, there is no going back. You are, you are stuck with Jesus. There is nowhere else to go. You are into the deep water. So Jesus is calling us to that deeper commitment, deeper into the heart of himself. And that journey is the journey of discipleship. Now, the interesting thing is that the other boat who is sitting on the floor is looking at it and laughing, you know. See, look at me. I'm just still here. I'm okay. I'm sitting here. And this other poor boat is going through this misery, right? Like going through the bar, like I said, stability to instability. And then gets this great catch. Great catch happens only in the deep waters, by the way. Many people, you know, one of the things which kind of makes me sad about our Christian life not Christian life in the sense, Christian churches, is that very often we do the leaving part. We leave the floor or we leave the shore, but goes only at a safe distance. Because of that, we have neither shore nor the real catch. Many Christians I see are very disappointed at the, about their own Christian life. I have left everything for the Lord. You know, I'm suffering through this life. This world is full of suffering. And, but I know God is going to come. You know, I am going to be standing in front of the Lord and I'm going to get my reward. I'm going to get my joy one day. Until that time, I'm going to be this miserable Christian complaining about everything. There is no joy. There is no happiness. You should rather be on the shore or you should be on the deep water. Being in between is a miserable. Is, that is the real misery. If you go deep into the water, you get a good catch. And many people don't get that catch because they are not willing to go deep into the water. Right? And the good thing is that, so once that boat got this deep, you know, went deep into the water and got this big catch, what happens? It was going to sink because the joy was overwhelming. The catch was overwhelming. The treasure was overwhelming. So then the other ship is called too. And the guy who was sitting doing nothing got all the blessings too. Right? This poor ship is the one, the poor boat is what got the catch. And But because of that boat, the other boat also got blessed. Now that's, that's a very interesting situation. You know, very, now, when we pray... To God, what are we praying? We are praying for blessings or we are praying to become a blessing for other people. See, the boat which traveled to the deep became a blessing for the boat which was on the shore. Maybe there is a sense of injustice. But the fact that because the other ship ventured deep into the water, the other ship or the boat also got blessed. And as Christians... We should not be praying for all the blessings, which is okay. We need to have blessings. We need to have the catch. We need to have the treasure. We need to have the joy. But we should rather pray that we will become a blessing for other boards, those who are on the shore or those who are little away from the land, so that that deeper commitment we have will inspire other people, bless other people. And that is exactly what evangelism is. Evangelism is not exactly going around and preaching and giving tracts, which is okay, we need to do all that. But through our own commitment, the God's glory will exude from us if we enjoy the real catch and the real joy. Now that is the deeper 
commitment and a deeper calling to the discipleship, which is that little boat which travels from stability to instability teach, uh, teaches us that lesson. And so does Peter. Now, today, I'm going to read a short passage from Peter's pursuit of Jesus, right? Yesterday, Jesus was pursuing Peter. And today, and uh, Peter is pursuing uh, Jesus. Luke chapter 22, verses 33 and 34. I'll read from NASB. That's the version I prefer. Um, Luke chapter 22, verses 33 and 34. This is also a very familiar passage. But he said to him, Lord, with you I am ready to go both to prison and to death. You know this. Peter is telling Jesus, right? He said to him, Lord, with you, I am ready to go both to prison and to death. And he said, Jesus said, I said to you, Peter, the rooster will not crow today until you have denied three times that you know me. Okay? That's a hard passage. <laughs> now, Pretend that Jesus is not listening to this, right? <laughs> Pretend that Jesus is not here or, you know, we have a soundproof thing that Jesus is not here. But to be honest with me, don't you feel like Jesus was a little mean? Right? Peter was saying that, Lord, and you know, it comes from deep within his heart. Lord, I'm, come, I'm ready to come. I'm ready to follow you. I am passionately pursuing you. I'm ready to come and follow you to death. I'm ready to die. And immediately Jesus looks, at, looks back at him, publicly humiliate him, right? That's, that's quite, you know, it's kind of difficult to grasp, particularly when you, when, when you consider. I, think, I mean, even if Jesus knew that, even if Jesus, I mean, obviously Jesus knows that he's God, right? He knows. But do you really have to say that? <laughs> do you really have to say that to embarrass the leader of the disciple in front of everybody, Right? You know, when I speak um, in various platforms, uh, sometimes people are so passionate. They are very excited and they listen to a good message. They can say, Pastor Matthew, I need to have a coffee with you. We need to do this. We need to do that. We need to save the world. And we are going to have a coffee. Please give me a number. All this. And they are very excited. And you know how many of them actually call? Maybe 5%, lucky enough. Maybe 3 to 5 out of 100 people will call, right? So initially, when I started as a young preacher, started this, I used to get excited. Whoa, whoa, whoa. I'm, I want to save the world too. And I want to do coffee with all these people. I want to save the world. But now when, I, when people say that, and some people are genuine, obviously, and some people come back too. But generally, I know. Yeah, 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 I know, I know. <laughs> but I, 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 I'm very polite to them. I don't say that I know you're not going to go for a coffee. And so I, I tell everybody, yeah, yeah, let's go for coffee. Because I know they are not going to call me back. Because it's that excitement. They had a great sermon. Something touched them. Like we uh, discussed yesterday. P Peter had this amazing experience. Then he went back to the ocean of the world. Right? And so, but, but I will never discourage anybody saying that, yeah, yeah, I don't believe that you're going to call. I, I don't want to embarrass them. I don't want to humiliate them. But Jesus kind of did that. Right? And particularly, <laughs> there's another apostle. Uh, you know this apostle, very well. He is the apostle of India. Thomas, right? Thomas did something like this. Very similar. Um, I'll read a, um, a verse from John chapter 11. And uh, you know John chapter 11? What is happening in John chapter 11? The resurrection of Lazarus, right? So uh, Jesus gets the news that Lazarus is uh, sick. Then after a couple days, Jesus realizes that he is dead, right? In his foreknowledge, he realizes that he's dead. But there is a, you know, there is some nuances in which they say, if they go back, the disciples say, uh, Rabbi, the Jews were just now seeking to stone you and you are going there again? Jesus says, we are in Galilee. Let's go to Judea to Lazarus' house. So the disciple says, 
don't do that because they are going to kill you they are ready they are they are ready with their stone so our apostle the apostle of india thomas jumps up and he says this 11 uh, verse 16 he says therefore thomas who is called didymus said to his fellow fellow disciples let us also go so that we may die with him aha uh-huh. all these other disciples said they let's not go there thomas was the champion including peter probably was scared at that time thomas was the champion who said let's go and die with our master and where was this thomas when jesus died he was nowhere in the vicinity right he probably left at the at gethsemane right he was not there and the funny thing about thomas that he was not there even at, even after resurrection right first time jesus came for uh, after resurrection thomas was not there it was a labor day weekend or something he went somewhere else <laughs> right he was busy with the other stuff <laughs> then the next week he, he came and started saying theology whatever you heard you know that's not right there's something wrong with that all this you, you know what what i'm talking about so he was that was a very shallow comment right like you know but but at that time thomas out of his excitement said let's go and die with them now jesus would have looked at him and uh, he would have laughed inside thomas you have no idea what you are saying you have no idea where I, you are going to be when i am dying you have no idea how much i have been praying like uh, you know jesus said uh, peter i have been praying for you the enemy asked permission to sift you like wheat but i was interceding for you peter i have been praying for you you have no idea you think you have a smart guy you think you can get everything together but you have no idea without my help you cannot do anything without my pursuit you cannot do anything now the point is why didn't jesus say that to thomas that was a good time for him to be embarrassed and he deserved it too right so uh, yeah it's it's kind of funny right like jesus didn't do that to thomas but he did to peter kind of publicly kind of humiliated him i'm a little upset about that so <laughs> so uh, so let me let me put this another way this is why i said you know it might be a little i, I want you to like i said yesterday this is a journey this is not a sermon this is a journey i want you to come somewhere with me i want you to think with me okay so uh, let me let me unfold some imagination let, let's let's use some imagination okay this is this is not scripture the next few things i'm going to say but let me ask you a question okay imagine okay imagine what would have happened if the rooster didn't crow what would have happened you know jesus said you know you're going to uh, deny me three times before the rooster crow right and of course you know it would do that and that's why it was said but just for fun you know imagine what would have happened okay i will i i will see i will i will i will share with you my conjecture again this is not the word of god my my idea but what first i am going from the word of god so let's let's see what happened actually okay luke chapter 22 um i'm going to 54 i'm going to read from 54 having arrested him jesus they led him away and brought him to the house of the high priest Jesus is being taken from Gethsemane to the high priest and Peter was following at a distance now if it was me i wouldn't have followed because it's a very very tricky position to be in like other disciples including our thomas and everybody else i would have run away right you know this is the time to run for cover right but peter was very different he pursued he pursued he was, he had passionate pursuit peter is one of the best example we can get so he pursued but at a safe distance right and then peter was following at a distance after they had kindled a fire in the middle of the courtyard and had sat down together peter was sitting among them and a servant girl seeing him as he sat in the firelight and looking intently at him said this man was with him too but he denied it saying woman i do not know him okay you know the story 
Peter is looking a little different. He is from Galilee. You know, people in Galilee are kind of blue-collar uh, kind of workers, and people in Judea are generally very aristocrats. People can be identified by their look and even their accent, which, you know, accent is something you cannot just change. You may be able to converse in English very well, but your accent kind of comes with you. So, you know, there, there are certain things they can identify. They realize that. So this, this woman realized that this man is with Jesus. And uh, fair enough. Now, Peter, this is your clue. If I am Peter, you wouldn't see me. I mean, I might be brave enough to come I'm to the courtyard. But the moment somebody recognizes me, and I will run for cover. I will walk away. I will walk away. I will not do that. But Peter, Peter, Peter goes again, right? Peter said, uh, man, I am not. Then after about an hour had passed, sorry, th this is the second one. A little later, another saw him and said, you are one of them too. But Peter said, man, I am not. So this is the second Denial. He went back. Again, he was identified. Now, if you have something in your head other than clay, if you are not naive, you should really, really run. You are recognized two times. This is a very, very dangerous, very, very precarious situation. Run away. No, no, no. Peter won't. Peter won't. He is a passionate pursuer. Right? He comes back again. After an hour had passed, another man began to insist, saying, Certainly, this man also was with him, for he is a Galilean too. But Peter said, Man, I do not know what you are talking about. Immediately, immediately, while he was still speaking, a rooster crowed. This is my question. What would have happened if that rooster did not crow? Eh? I think, you know, don't take it from me. It's my imagination. You know, don't question me on this. I think Peter would have gone back again. That's, kind, that's the kind of person Peter is. If you know anything about Peter, he is, you know, how many of you have heard about, you know, Nike shoes? You know, Nike shoes, one of my favorite brands too, right? Uh, if I will, you know, Nike has a slogan. You know what Nike slogan is? Just do it, right? Yeah, somebody said, just do it. And I believe if Peter lived today, Peter will be a good model for Nike shoes. Because that's his model. He doesn't really think a lot. Because a passionate person doesn't think a lot. If you are passionate about somebody, especially, you know, passion is almost always equated with love. When you love somebody, the word is fall in love with somebody. What does that mean? When you love, if you truly love a person, you actually fall. The love is, love is actually something defies reason, defies logic, and defies experience. That's what real passion is. So it's not Peter is, 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 is naive or anything, but he is so passionate. He has embarked on a journey that defies logic and defies experience. He loves his master so much so that he will just do it. He will just do it. You know, there is another uh, place where Jesus said, well, his you know, when Jesus started his ministry, it was very interesting. And then his uh, sermons started getting a little tougher and tougher. And then Jesus started saying kind of weird things like, uh, oh, my body is like flesh. And unless you eat this flesh, unless you drink my blood, you will not, uh, you know, see, enter into the kingdom of God. And then then a lot of people, I'm, I'm saying this from John chapter 6, this is not imagination. <laughs> so people said, Lord... This is not fair. People don't get it. So you have to really turn it down. So Jesus looked around, John chapter 6, 67, you can go home and read. Jesus looks, looks around and said, ask the disciples, do you also want to go? So Jesus doesn't say, okay, let's turn it down. Let's make it a little more seeker sensitive and all that. No, Jesus said, do you also want to go? 
Peter stands up and says, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. Peter is saying that, Lord, I have come to the deepest waters with you. I have burned all the bridges. I am sold out for your cause. I cannot go back. I wish. If I were a little away from the land, I could, have, I could have gone back. But I have come this far. To whom shall we go? I have nowhere else to go, Master. So I am going to come with you. That's why what Peter said at that moment was really, really from his heart. He would have gone and he would have died for Jesus. That is the characteristics of a passionate pursuer of God. A true disciple is a passionate pursuer of God. There is a similar strange guy <laughs> in the Old Testament. Um, his name is Elisha. Uh, <laughs> not strange, in a good way, right? Uh, let me read uh, uh, from 2 Kings. So this is the 2 Kings uh, chapter 2. So this is an episode where his master, Elijah, is going to take off. You remember, he was taken into the heaven, right? And just before that, Elijah is saying that it's my time to go, so I'm going to go. Elisha is the next person, kind of unofficial appointment, everything is done. And so they are going to go. I'm going to read some verses. So chapter 2, verse 2 says, Elijah said to Elisha, Stay here, please, for the Lord has sent me as far as Bethel. Okay? So they are in a place called Gilgal. Then Elijah says to his disciple, which is Elisha, you be here, okay? And I'm going to go to Bethel. God asked me to go to Bethel. And guess what Eli Elisha says? As the Lord lives and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. I will not. No, no way. The master says, you stay here. The disciples say, no, no, I'm going to be after you, whether you like it or not. So they went down to Bethel. Then the sons of the prophets who were at Bethel came out to Elisha and said to him, these are the other Christians, or not Christians, the other, other group, other fellow prophets. They, they are discouraging Elisha. Do you know that the Lord will take away your master from over you today? And he said, yes, I know, be still. So the other prophets who said, don't do this, because Elisha is going to be taken away, don't go after him, says, I know, don't teach me, okay, be still. It's almost like saying that, shut up, right, like, you know, don't, don't speak to me, I know what I'm doing, I want to be with the master, I'm a person, passionate pursuer, I'm not going to leave my master, even if the master asks me to do, right. So then, Elijah said to him, again, Elisha, Please stay here. Okay, he came, me, came with me up to Bethel. Fine, okay? I'm not really liking it, but you, want, you don't want to leave me, so fine. For the Lord has sent me to Jericho. I'm going to go to Jericho. But he said, as the Lord leaves, and as you yourself leave, I will not leave you. Okay? The same thing. The sons of the prophet comes and rem reminds him again. Do you know that the Lord will take away your master from over you today? He says the same response. Yes, I know. Shut up or be still, right? Don't, don't talk to me about this. Don't give me all this discouraging news. I want to be with my master. That's all that matter for a disciple. And then a disciple. And then Elijah said to him, Please stay here, for the Lord has sent me to Jordan. And again says, Elisha, as the Lord lives and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. This is the spirit. He is an Old Testament Peter. The guy won't let go. <laughs> Even if you ask him to go, he won't go. Because he has fallen in love with his master. From Gilgal to Bethel to Jericho. To Jordan. It doesn't matter where the master is going. I will go wherever he goes. In the end, he crossed over Jordan with his master. That's why he gets the double portion. 
We sit here and ask for the Holy Spirit, give me a double portion. He give me a double portion. We are anchored to the shore. We are not even willing to step into the water, but we want the same double portion. The double portion is meant to be people go deeper and deeper and deeper into the deep waters. That's where the double portion. Even if the, even, even the master uh, said, don't go, even all other people said, don't go, he will still go. That's the same spirit. The same spirit our Peter had. Peter said, Lord, I am going to come and I am going to die with you no matter what. So I think, so my belief is that Peter would have gone a fourth time and somebody would have definitely caught him at that time. Okay, If they didn't catch him, I know Peter well enough to say that he would have gone a fifth time. And finally somebody would have caught him. Right? So Jesus kind of uses, and this is again, this is my imagination, right? And Jesus knew when Peter says something, he meant business. Peter is serious. You remember first time when Jesus declared that I am going to suffer for the sake of you and I am going to, the son of man will suffer, the son of man will die and everything said the first thing Peter did, he took him aside. Okay, Mark chapter 8, 31, we don't have to read. He took him aside and told The master, master, it should not happen to you. It cannot happen to you as long as I live. I will not let this happen to you. Then Jesus said, get behind me, Satan, right? But Jesus knew the guy is serious. He meant business. He is not like Thomas. If Thomas said that, he would say, yeah, 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 okay, Thomas, very good. We'll see, yeah, let's, let's talk about it later. But when Peter said, he knew that unless and until he rebuked Peter, he would do unthinkable. And he did the unthinkable. He was not talking. He was acting. You remember when they came to arrest Jesus? Peter, who took a sword, a fisherman who has never taken anything other than the net or a hook, he took the sword and, you know, he was swinging it. And he, the guy doesn't even know how to swing a sword. That's why instead of the head, he got the ear. He didn't have any practice, but it doesn't matter. You are not going to touch my Lord. As long as Peter lives, nobody touches Jesus. That's the kind of man Jesus uh, sorry, Peter is like a bulldog, you know, in, and, and clinging on to Jesus. And I believe he would have been caught if the rooster did not crow. He would have been caught and he would have been crucified even before Jesus was crucified. And that's my imagination. Okay, Nobody told me this, but it's my imagination. And I'm, in my imagination, I can see Jesus thinking, man, this Peter. Just like Elisha, he is clinging on to me. And I have, I am seeing this future with him. He is supposed to be the leader of my church. On the day of Pentecost, he is going to rise up and preach and 3,000 people are going to get converted. And I am going to send him to Cornelius, the house of Cornelius, to declare gospel to the Gentiles for the first time. This Peter He's going to write two epistles for me. And this Peter, this guy is going to kill himself. This guy guy is going to mess up all my plans because of his sincerity. You know, he kind of need a warning. Again, imagination, right? You know, I think my thinking is that Jesus kind of devised a signaling system, a warning system to tell him, that, okay, this is the time to stop. This is the time for you to go back. It's interesting. The next verse says that the Lord turned and looked at Peter. The Lord turned and looked at Peter. You remember when we read John chapter 1, the very first time when Jesus saw Peter, how was it written? Jesus, it doesn't say that Jesus said to Peter, you are Simon, but he said, Jesus looked at him and said, there is something about the look, the way their eyes communicated. Jesus looked deep within the innermost being of Peter. And saw something nobody else could see. A Peter which is hidden inside Simon. That was the essence of our class yesterday. It is the same look again. And I don't think it is a look of contempt. I don't think Jesus... "Ah, 
what, you know, oh, this is what he said. You know, it was not a look of contempt. I think it was a look of the same look he gave in John chapter 1. Peter, this is time for you to recognize how fragile you are. How frail you are. All you can do is to obey my commandment, Peter. So go back and live your destiny. Go back and become a Peter, not a Simon. Do that journey from who you are and who you are meant to be, who you are created to be. And I think that was the signal. And the next word says that Peter went out and he wept bitterly. And if you ask me as a storyteller, I think that is the only thing which you could take Peter out. That is the only thing which could take Peter out because Peter was passionately in love with his master and he was going to pursue Jesus at any time. And Jesus said, this is your chance to go back and I want you to go back, Peter. It is much easier for you to die for me than to live for me. You know, dying for Christ is not that difficult. Sometimes living for Christ is even more difficult than dying for Christ. Peter, I don't want you to die with me today. That's what is going to happen, Peter. You're going to come back again. They are going to arrest you. I don't want that to happen, Peter. I want you to go and live. I want you to write two epistles. I want you to preach that sermon which brings 3,000 people into the church. I want you to lead my church. I want you to take the gospel to the Gentile, Peter. That's what I want, support. I, I want you to do. So here I am giving you a lesson from your failure. If that public humiliation didn't happen, if that thing Jesus did not say about the crowing of the rooster, the rooster would have just crowed and Peter would have, you know, that would have, wouldn't have mattered. Because it was given to him in advance, he knew where he was broken. He understood the point in which he realized the need of God's intervention in his life. And he knew that he couldn't do it without God, even if he is more passionate than anybody else in the world. Now you can forget everything I said, because I said it's an imagination. If it inspired you, good, but I don't want anybody to say that this guy preached from something, you know, which is not in the scripture. But I want you to take away a couple of things from this. One thing I want you to know, sometimes, sometimes God allows failures and humiliation in our life in order to save us from ourselves. I'll say that one more time. Sometimes God allows even orchestrate <laughs> this kind of seems like a setup. Paul was set sorry, Peter was set up for this failure kind of, right? But sometimes God will allow to have failure in your in your life so that he can save you from yourself. What does that mean? You know what? We always think that we need deliverance from the enemy, Satan. But Satan is not our biggest enemy, you know. Our biggest enemy, yeah, we are our own worst enemy. You know, have you heard about that? You know, it's, a, it's not in the Bible, but it's a common phrase. We are our worst enemies. Our imagination, our ideas, and sometimes our principled lives itself can be, you know, a good thing. We have some good principles, but that could be coming out of our ego and you will never know unless you are humbled before God. I'll tell you a kind of funny story. It's not funny anymore. It's painful for me to say that, but it is. You know, uh, first marriage proposal I got <laughs> when I was in Kerala, I was in India. Um, you know, I was 21 years old. Uh, and uh, this marriage proposal was from America, <laughs> an 18-year-old girl. I'm like, man, my daughter is 18-year-old. <laughs> I just, I don't know. And I, I still remember, and there was this pastor, they were insisting that this marriage should happen and all that. And I was in Chennai at the time. I took peace, you know, this is before email and all that, right? Like, you know, I wrote a letter to my dad saying that never ever come to me with this kind of proposal because I was so angry with all the Pentecostals have this big uh, uh, fascination for going to America, going to America. Like, you know, I said, I will never ever go to America. I don't like going to America. I am a proud Indian. 
I have a very good job in India, and I'm proud everybody who's going to America are going there for money. They are very consumer-minded, materialistic, and I don't want, I will never go to America. I wrote this letter. My father was very upset, uh, but, you know, so that happened. And, uh, you know, things happened, and, and I remember when our marriage proposal, Joanne and I, you know, when our marriage proposal came, uh, you know, I really like Joanne, and I still do after 20, almost 20 years. <laughs> but when the marriage proposal came, they were in the Middle East, and they had filed their immigration papers to go to Canada, immigration for Canada. So the, the person who brought the marriage proposal is, is Joanne's aunt, mommy's sister, who lives in Kochi, and she, she knew me, and uh, you know, obviously she knew the family too. And I, I told her only one thing. I said, I'm very excited to marry Joanne. I, I consider it, it is a privilege to marry her. But I have one condition. I don't want her to go to Canada. I don't want her to go to Canada. I will not go to Canada. I will, uh, <laughs> because I thought I was saying this from my uh, principle. I had a good principle, by the way. I had a good job and I had a flat and all that. You know, I had a very colorful life back in the days. So I thought I'm saying this you know, as a good thing, but little did I know, a lot of this came from my ego, right? Sometimes these highest principles we say, like Sadducees and Pharisees, they are the highest principle people. Right? They had that, such amazing principles, but sometimes we don't know. What if God wanted you to go to America? What if God wanted you to go to Africa? You can, you should never say never to God. You should never say never. That's one thing I've learned after 20 years of humiliation in front of God. I'm not going to tell you the story of how we ended up in Canada. And I, I'm not going to tell you because it was not pretty. I didn't want to come, but, you know, a series of public humiliations. Uh, and eventually, I ended up in nowhere. Uh, you know, finally, we came to Canada. And some of you know, like, you know, almost 18 years ago. Uh, and uh, I remember still when I go to India... Our marriage broker, which is Joanne's aunt, mommy's sister, she always say, "Nda saipa, Canada on the board land or the Like you know, so whenever she says something, you know, I always, you know, we do tit for tat. Whatever she says, I have something again. But when she says this, I have nothing to say. I am, I am eating my humble pie. Then I say, oh, at least I went to Canada. You know, I didn't go to America. That was my real principle. You know, I said, I, I won't go to America. That's what I said. But, you know, a series of <laughs> fortunate and unfortunate events evolved, and we ended up in America for the last six years. Now when I go home, it's not the aunt I'm afraid of. My dad, he still keeps that letter. <laughs> he still keeps that letter. And the America go on the ball and the Where are you coming from? So I'm, so I'm, I'm saying this. You know, uh, it, it is a very humiliating story for me, but I am, I am okay because I am humbled in my family so that I will not be humiliated in front of men, you know. Sometimes it is good to eat that humble pie. Yesterday we were talking about one of the mega church pastors in Chicago, the Willow Creek pastors, you know, many pastors who end up like famous figures and nobody questions them and nobody, they are like the rock, rock stars and, you know, all that. Because of that, anybody try to uh, give them some kind of advice or counsel, even they, they refuse to accept that because nobody is supposed to question the pastor. They don't want to be humbled. And because of that, one day suddenly they get humiliated in front of public in one instant everything goes down the drain so it is okay to be humbled before God so that you will not be humiliated by men you know in front of men so the point I'm trying to make is sometimes God allows that failure in our life to save us from our own principles and our own egos and our own self-righteousness which is kind of what I think uh, Jesus was doing with Peter. Peter. Jesus took Peter seriously. That's why Jesus humiliated Peter. Jesus never took Thomas seriously. That's why he was never humiliated. If some of you feel that you are humbled by God, 
you are humiliated by God, that's because God takes you seriously. There are some other people like the boats in the shore, they are having a cushy life, they are having a happy life, and you are, you know, you are in, in this instability, you know, rock and rolling in these waves and all that, because God takes you seriously. That's why. That's why. You should be encouraged about that. Another thing I want, yeah, so what I meant is it is better to fail in the hands of God rather than succeed in the eyes of men, right? You know, I, uh, I just dropped off my little daughter, <laughs> not little anymore, 18-year-old daughter at York University today. And it's such a, a painful departure for me because this is like a new era in our relationship. And I told her, uh, Hannah, uh, I had always dropped them off and picked them up from the school. So I'm, I'm, I, I told her, Hannah, I'm going to drop you off now. And I'm not going to come and pick you up this evening because now you are on your own. But I know one thing. You are going to fail. Now, that's not a very encouraging <laughs> thing for a father to tell the daughter. Uh, but you are going to fail because I believe God loves you. God will take you through some humiliation. And God will take you through some failure because he loves you. But I want you to know that whenever you fail, I want you to fail in the hands of God. If you fail outside, that's a problem. It is better to fail inside the church. It is, fail, it is better to fail inside because we are simple, fragile human beings. It is better to fail inside God's hand than going outside and making the mistake. So it is okay for you to do that. And as your father, I will always come to pick you up. I will always come to pick you up. So, so here, uh, Peter always had that courage and that audacity to take that big step for God. And, and even then, even Peter's failure was turned into something beautiful. And we kind of make fun of Peter for being, oh, a man of little faith, right? That's what we call man of little faith. Yeah, because Jesus called him a man of little faith. But did you know uh, Peter and after Jesus, of, Jesus is not just a human being, but Peter is the only human being who has ever walked on water? Even though he sunk, he really walked on water. Don't you think so? He did that, right? Go home and read Matthew chapter, I think it's 14, where that whole story is written. You know, when they were going in the boat and all this, uh, this big uh, wind coming. And then, G you know, he, he, they, they see Jesus and immediately they think it is a ghost, right? Now, the interesting thing, and this is not I wanted to preach, but I, I just want you to note something about Peter. And they think... It is a ghost, right? In the middle of the night, they see this, uh, this shape of a person walking in the water. And then everybody thinks it's a ghost. And Jesus said, no, I'm not a ghost. It is me. And then Peter says this, Lord, if it is you, let me come into the water. Now, that's very interesting. Now, Paul, Peter says, I want to prove that it is you, Okay. I want a proof that it, that it is you, but I want that proof to be manifested in me, not in you. If I were Peter, I would have said, Lord, if it is really you, I want you to perform a miracle. Do something magical. Do something spectacular so that I will be very, very sure that you are God. Now Peter says, no, no, no. If it is you, let you do something in me, not you. I want to be, you know, I want to be transformed. That is the point. That is the proof of your existence. That is the proof of your authenticity. That is the kind of person Peter is. He says, let that manifest in me. And Jesus says, come Peter. And he walked. He walked on water. And then he began to sink. What would happen if you are a fisherman? You are walking on water. You begin to sink. What do you do? He, you can swim, right? Peter doesn't swim. He is just crying out, Master, Master, help me, right? Like, you know? Now, that is the beauty of Peter. Peter would rather sink than swim back. Peter could have tried. If I were in Peter's place, I would. my first instinct is to swim. 
swim back to the boat. Maybe it was a ghost. Maybe the whole thing was a hoax. Maybe it was a mistake and I don't know. So I have to go back. No, that is our first instinct. But Peter doesn't do that. Peter says, Master. He wants to see that hand coming over and holding him. Not because he doesn't know to do things by his own. He is smart enough to do that when you come to that ship and all that. But a boat and all that. But Peter wanted Jesus' hand coming down and reaching him. You know? So that is the beauty of that relationship. That is where that true relationship is being formed. And one last thing I want, I want you to know. A true disciple is somebody who can be trusted in failure. See, it is much easy to trust people when they are successful. You know, trust is a big thing in any relationship. For example, marriage relationship. And very often you see couple, very lovey-dovey, they love each other, they care for each other and all that. But when tragedy strikes, when there is a financial issue, mortgage is due, and the house is going to be foreclosed, or something happens to the child, or something happened in the family, when tragedy comes, that is the real test of relationship. Only when you really, only then you really know how strong this bond you have developed, you have formed between yourself. So can we, can we be trusted in our failure? Right? Thomas can be trusted in his success. Thomas is A plus on his success. But only Peter, even though he is a man of little faith, even though he has only C minus on this paper, but Jesus knows this is a guy I can count on. This is a guy I can trust on his failure. And even in this failure, even in the public humiliation, he carries through in that relationship. And sometime, I want you to remember that, sometime God will allow you to fail in a good thing so that he can ask you to do better things. Right? Peter wanted to die for Christ. That's all he wanted to do. Right? But Jesus asked him to fail in that good task so that he can live for Christ. He can do amazing things for Christ, which is even more difficult. And you can do that best thing. You know, you know God's best is almost always done at our worst. When we are at the worst possible condition, that's when God's best work is done. I can bring you so many, so many characters from the Bible to prove that. I, my own, you know, my own life is an example of that. So don't be disappointed. That's why even Paul said, I will boast also in my weakness. Paul says that I will boast in my weakness because that's when the Lord comes to me, close to me, and, and then he says, my grace is sufficient for you, Paul. I'm going to walk with you. Now you can feel my breath in your neck. I'm so close to you. And that's why Paul boasts in his weakness because God's best is done in our worst. And God, sometimes Jesus will allow you to fail because he knows that you can be trusted in your failure. Because that's the time God can use you and shape you and mold you into that passionate disciple, passionate pursuer of God. So let's close our eyes. Let's go to God. And I know some of us are really struggling with some of these kind of issues in our own life. And we have good ambitions. We have good desires and we thought we are doing a good thing for the Lord. We are doing a good thing for the Lord. But we don't know why it failed. If we did the right thing and if we really pursued the will of God, how could this go wrong? And we have these questions. But I want you to know that Jesus trusts you. Jesus takes you seriously. And Jesus knows that you are a passionate pursuer of him. But today, this evening, he has news for you. The same eyes that looked at Peter right after his third denial, that the same eyes are looking at you too and saying to you, do not worry. Do not worry. I have seen this coming. 
You know, Peter, when I was being whipped, when I was being flogged, I was being tortured in the chambers of the high priest. When I was being questioned by high priest, you know, Peter, you were always in my mind. I was not thinking about me. I was not thinking about what is going to happen to me. I was thinking about you. My eyes were always in the courtyard. I was wondering what will happen to you, Peter, because I have arranged a rooster to protect you. The rooster is not to embarrass you. It is to protect you. If the rooster did not crow, Peter, you would, you would have been, you would have become a public humiliation. And it is there to protect you, Peter. Thank God for the roosters that crow. To acknowledge, to remind us of our own failures. Very often we don't want other people to remind us of our failures. We want to cut the throat of the rooster that crows. We don't want to hear this annoying crowing because it is humbling us, it's humiliating us. But, but I'm telling you, it is protecting you. The eyes of Jesus are on you. And as you are advancing from the courtyard to the porch and he knows that you are getting into gateway. But Peter, I want you to live for me. Peter, I want, I don't want you to be Simon anymore. I want you to be Peter. I want to be the same rock from which this, this rock, you know, you are a rock that is grafted from this bigger rock. And that is your destiny. I want you to fulfill your destiny. And that is why I am pursuing you. That is why I have stepped into your board. And Peter, you think that you are pursuing me. But really, Peter, I am still the pursuer. My eyes are the ones watching you. I appreciate your love for me. And I appreciate your passion for me. I appreciate the fact that you took the sword for me. I appreciate the fact that you tried to rebuke me or reprimand me. Don't let this happen to me. But Peter, you have no idea what is happening in the spiritual realm. You have no idea how the will of God is manifested and unfold, unfolded in this world. So one day you will realize it, Peter. For the, for the time being, it's a mystery. But the only thing I want you to remember that the failure is not betrayal. You haven't betrayed God. It's not even a denial. You just fail. But I'm here to pick you up. And you are going to walk on water. And you are going to live your destiny. Father God, we thank you for the fact that you love this tiny little human being so much so that you would send your only begotten son so that everyone who believes in him shall never perish but will have everlasting life. And thank you for pursuing us to the deepest waters where we were lost, we were confused, we thought we knew fishing, we thought we got it all together, but in our own success, you broke us you broke our ego so that we could be shaped into your image and in your likeness. And thank you for pursuing us. And we surrender ourselves, Lord, as your true disciples. And following you like Elisha did. We are not going to stop at Gilgal or we are not going to stop at Bethel. We are not going to Jericho. We stop at Jericho. We want to cross Jordan because we want to see the majesty of God. We want to get the double portion anointing because we want to live our fulfilled life the fullest to the destiny. And we thank you for the church. We thank you for everybody here and help us to live a life that is transformed, walking deeper and deeper into the very heart of God. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. God bless Ninu de swanda matre, yenu me nyani niyum. Ninu de swanda matre, unu me shakta mali benda matuwa yendo ru bhagya mida. Hallelujah, Amen, ah, Hallelujah, Hallelujah, Amen, ah, Hallelujah, Yes.
that humiliation he makes us to understand it's not to destroy us but it is to build us for a deeper relationship that we will be preserved for a better future amen as we submit ourselves before the word as we examine ourselves this evening every situation of our life the lord leads us that it is for good and for a better future that god build us so that we will not be humiliated before the world but we are safe in the hands of god amen as we pray i request pastor manoj to come forward and pray and close this session കഥാവേ സ്വർഗഷ്ട പിതാവേ ശാന്തമായ അന്തരീക്ഷത്തിൽ ഈ രാത്രി ഞങ്ങളോട് സംസാരിച്ച ദൈവവചനങ്ങൾക്കായി സ്തോത്രം കഥാവിൻ്റെ ആത്മാവ് ഞങ്ങളിരിക്കുന്നുവെന്നും നിന്റെ ദൃഷ്ടി ഞങ്ങളുടെ മേലുണ്ടെന്നും ഈ രാത്രി ഞങ്ങളെ കേൾപ്പിച്ചത് ഓർത്ത് സ്തോത്രം പലപ്പോഴും ജീവിതയാത്രയിൽ ഫെയിലേഴ്സ് കടന്നു വരുമ്പോൾ ഹ്യൂമിലിയേഷൻസ് കടന്നു വരുമ്പോൾ കഥാവേ നിന്റെ ഒരു കരുതൽ ഞങ്ങളുടെ മേലുണ്ടെന്നും ഞങ്ങളെ തിരികെ കൊണ്ടുവരുവാൻ ഞങ്ങളെ പേഴ്സ്യു ചെയ്യുന്ന ഞങ്ങളെ സ്നേഹിക്കുന്ന ഞങ്ങളുടെ അടുക്കലേക്ക് കടന്നു വരുന്ന ഒരു ദൈവ സാന്നിധ്യം ഇന്ന് രാത്രി ഫീൽ ചെയ്യത്തക്ക രീതിയിൽ പരിശുദ്ധാത്മാവ് ഞങ്ങളോട് സംസാരിച്ചത് ഓർത്ത് സ്തോത്രം ദൈവത്താൽ ഞങ്ങളുടെ ജീവിതത്തിൽ കൽപ്പിച്ചോചിക്കുന്ന എല്ലാ എൻവയോൺമെൻറ്റിനായി സ്തോത്രം ഞങ്ങളെ കർത്താവെ ക്രിസ്തുവിൽ ബോധവാന്മാരാക്കുന്ന എല്ലാ റൂസ്റ്റേഴ്സിനായി ഞങ്ങൾ സ്തോത്രം ചെയ്യുന്നു ഇന്ന് രാത്രി കർത്താവിൻ്റെ ദാസിന അഭിഷേകത്തോടുകൂടെ നിന്റെ വനം സംസാരിപ്പാനായി ഞങ്ങളെ ബലപ്പെടുത്തിയല്ലോ മുന്നോട്ടുള്ള ജീവിതയാത്രയിൽ കർത്താവെ നിന്നെ പ്രസാദിപ്പിച്ചുകൊണ്ട് നിന്റെ വനത്തിന് മുമ്പിൽ നിൽക്കുന്നവരായി നിന്റെ ആത്മാവിന് വിധേയപ്പെട്ടുകൊണ്ട് കർത്താവെ ജീവിതയാത്ര ഹോവിഡ് നാമത്തിന് പ്രസാദകരമായി തീരുവാൻ ഒരിക്കൽ കൂടെ ഞങ്ങൾ ഞങ്ങളെ തന്നെ ദൈവകരങ്ങളിലേക്ക് സമർപ്പിക്കുന്നു കർത്താവെ തിരുഹിതത്തിന് വെളിയിൽ പോകുവാൻ ഞങ്ങളെ അങ്ങ് അനുവദിക്കരുത് എന്ന് ഞങ്ങൾ പ്രാർത്ഥിക്കുന്നു ദൈവശബ്ദം എപ്പോഴും കേൾക്കുവാൻ ഞങ്ങളെ സഹായിക്കേണ്ടതിനായി ഞങ്ങൾ പ്രാർത്ഥിക്കുന്നു അങ്ങയുടെ ആലോചനയ്ക്ക് അനുസരിച്ച് മുന്നോട്ട് പോകുവാൻ ഒരിക്കൽ കൂടി ഞങ്ങളെ സമർപ്പിക്കുന്നു കർത്താവെ എന്റെ ദാസന ഞങ്ങൾ കർത്താവിന്റെ നാമത്തിൽ അനുഗ്രഹിക്കുന്നു തുടർന്ന് ശുശ്രൂഷകൾക്കായി ദൈവം നിയോഗം കൊടുത്ത് ആത്മാവിന്റെ അഭിഷേകത്തോടെ നിർത്തേണ്ടതിനായി ഞങ്ങൾ പ്രാർത്ഥിക്കുന്നു ഈ രാത്രി കടന്നുന്ന എല്ലാ ജനത്തിനായി സ്തോത്രം ഇവിടെയുള്ള ദൈവസഭയ്ക്ക് വേണ്ടി ഞങ്ങൾ പ്രാർത്ഥിക്കുന്നു കടന്നുന്ന എല്ലാ ദൈവദാസന്മാർക്കായി സ്തോത്രം ഈ ദൈവസഭയിൽ ഇടി എന്ന കഥാവിന്റെ ദാസനായി കഥാവെ തന്റെ കുടുംബത്തിനായി കുഞ്ഞുങ്ങൾക്കായിട്ടെല്ലാം ഞങ്ങൾ പ്രാർത
കർത്താവിനെ നാമം ചൊല്ലി സഭയെ ഞങ്ങൾ ഇന്ന് രാത്രി അനുഗ്രഹിച്ചു പ്രാർത്ഥിക്കുന്നു കർത്താവെ നിങ്ങളുടെ പ്രാർത്ഥനകളിൽ യാതൊന്നും കേട്ടതിനാൽ സ്തോത്രം യേശുക്ക് സുൻബിലീർ നാമത്തിൽ തന്നെ with the grace of our lord jesus christ the love of the father and the sweet communion of the holy spirit rest and abide with all of us for ever and ever more amen amen the third episode of this discipleship will be uh, dealt with tomorrow uh, i'm not asking uh, all those who are away fr- uh, like the from the other churches to come but tomorrow will be the culmination the climax of the third episode of the teaching of the discipleship and uh, once for uh, thank you for everyone who has come this evening god bless you praise the lord go in peace amen you don't have any meeting in the evening right no tomorrow